Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. We've got a damning report from the city inspector general on the police response to unrest in the wake of George Floyd's killing. Princeton University professor Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. talks about his and writer James Baldwin's hopes for the nation in tonight's Black Voices book club selection. Actor Diane Carroll tells a hair-raising story in a 1968 throwback from WTTW's Our People. For a winning season like I've never seen. And how does gospel music vary from other music genres? Arts correspondent Angel Edo checks in with a local gospel group to find out. First off tonight, the Chicago Police Department botched nearly every aspect of its response to the protests and unrest triggered by the death of George Floyd, undermining efforts to rebuild the community's trust in the department. All of that is according to a new report from the city's inspector general released last week. The report is also highly critical of Mayor Lori Lightfoot and depicts police superintendent David Brown as slow to react and at times confused. Joining us now is the author of that report, Chicago Deputy Inspector General for Public Safety, Deborah Witzberg. Thank you for joining us on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. So obviously a very a scathing report of the Chicago Police Department and its response last summer. What were the most significant findings uh, of, or excuse me, significant failures of CPD that you document in this report? I think at, at, it, at the most profound level, this was a failure of leadership. This was a failure of the senior leadership of the Chicago Police Department that endangered members of the public and left frontline members of the police department without adequate support and guidance and really left those frontline members to sort of high stakes improvisation, which had bad outcomes. You say that CPD uh, was, quote, underprepared and ill-equipped, qu consequently failing both uh, the frontline officers as well as the public. Why weren't they prepared for this? Well, I think, I think there were sort of two dimensions to the lack of preparedness here, a longer term one and a shorter term one. In the longer term, you know, it, it, you would want it to be the case that a major city police department had sort of a contingency plan available for large scale public demonstrations and large scale civil unrest um, sort of sitting in a drawer somewhere ready to be activated. And I think there were real shortcomings there with that kind of backup, you know, contingency plan in place in, in the longer term. In, in the shorter term view of preparedness, in the days between the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the sort of unraveling of events here in Chicago, there was a fair amount of information out there and available, and in fact, in the hands of leadership in the police department and in, in City Hall, about events that were occurring in other major cities in the United States, um, as well as information to suggest that large scale events were coming to Chicago. And I think given the information that was available, I think the city and the department could and should have done better to be prepared. Now, you spoke with both uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot as well as Police Superintendent uh, David Brown. Um, and in the report, uh, Superintendent David Brown says the department, quote, struggled with certain aspects of its response. And it, he goes on, he also says in the report that it, the department will use the Inspector General's findings as an additional tool to self-evaluate and move forward to be a better police department for the city of Chicago. Um, and additionally, Mayor Lori Lightfoot said today that the police department has already learned some lessons from the mistakes that it has made and that she still has confidence in Superintendent Brown leadership. Here's a little bit more of what she had to say. The Chicago Police Department obviously took a deep look at what happened over the course of that time period. The police department, I think, learned a lot from that experience um, and put that learning into practice over the course of the summer and the fall and, and currently. 
Now, in your view, the police department, ha have they already absorbed some of the lessons from last summer and some of the failings you document in your report? I certainly, for the for the moment, take the police department at its word that there are there are efforts underway to address some of these issues, and we know we know for certain that there are policy revisions underway. And in fact, that is one of the things that played into our decision to not include specific recommendations in this report is the very recognition of the fact that there are remedial efforts underway, and we want to sort of see where those improvements land, um, and and what sorts of improvements they bring about. And we should also mention that I think the police department and the public, we are expecting to hear from uh, the people who are overseeing the consent decree uh, that the police department is also involved in. Um, you know, were you, you were able to interview, as I mentioned, the mayor and the superintendent. What kind of insight did they provide when you were investigating this? Um, the, you know, the mayor and the superintendent are obviously the sort of primary decision makers um, in, in their respective positions. and. Um, you know, offered, I think, a lot of insight into the, the processes that they went through uh, in making critical decisions um, during the protest and unrest. Um, and I think what those, there are, there are a number of themes that kind of run through those decision processes. I think that there were, um, there were gaps in coordination and communication, both communication among entities between CPD and state and, and county entities, as well as, as other law enforcement agencies, but also communication and coordination within the department between the kind of leadership ranks and the people out on the street. Um, and so I think, you know, there were, um, there were kind of gaps there all around, which as I, you know, as I mentioned, I think really led to this situation where the people on the front line who were supposed to be executing decisions made at the highest levels really, really were without appropriate guidance and support in doing so. What kind of impact do you think, you know, the, the failure that you documented in your report, what kind of impact is that going to have on uh, the police department's ability to continue building relationships with the community or to try to rebuild relationships with the community? I think there are sort of logistical as well as philosophical consequences to, um, to the way this response went. I think on a logistical level, the absence of, of clear and complete records um, is compromising um, in terms of seeking individual accountability for, for potential acts of misconduct. Um, and I think, you know, I should say both for members of the department and members of the public. So I think that the absence of a clear record will compromise both police misconduct investigations and criminal prosecutions um, of, of members of the public. And I think sort of from a more philosophical perspective, I think there are costs to um, you know, to public confidence. And I think critically, the, um, the way that this response was handled by the senior leadership in the department, we will see that come at a cost in terms of both external and internal credibility. And, and to be specific, uh, you know, some of the criticisms uh, for the police department are, you know, poor record keeping with regard to use of force, not, um, not all police officers having body cameras, and therefore you say a lot of officers who were involved in misconduct or could have been, they'll never be held accountable. Are you, do you think any of those officers, is there any way to go back? Will they ever be held accountable, I guess? There certainly are misconduct investigations um, underway, and, and some which have which have com you know completed their kind of initial stages, arising out of allegations of misconduct. So it's not as though there will never be any individual um, individual accountability for any misconduct that happened during these events. But what I think we know for sure is that there will never be a complete record. Okay, and on the flip side of that, you say there are some folks, some people, some residents who may have engaged um, in rioting and looting, and uh, they may not uh, see any prosecution as well. Uh, you know, Deborah, if we've got like 15 seconds left, what do you think are the most important lessons here? You know, I, I think members of the public are entitled to a police department that serves and protects them, and members of the police department are entitled to leadership that provides them with adequate guidance and support. Okay, Deborah Woodsberg in the Office of the Inspector General. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Black women's hair, particularly in the workplace, has been the subject of endless discussion, even movies and documentaries in recent years. But in tonight's throwback from a rediscovered 1968 interview with actor Diane Carroll for WTTW's Our People, she tells a story that demonstrates it's not exactly a new issue. You know that we have always uh, had 
our greatest separation I, uh, is our color and then the texture of our hair. I was doing a film and I went to uh, the producer director and I explained to him that while we were on location, it would really be a good idea for him to have a hairdresser who knew how to do what is considered kinky hair. And uh, he said, why? And I said, well, because um, once uh, we're on location, and I think we're going to be away from towns and cities and so on and so forth, if you're doing a shot and it's, it's very humid, it's going to be hard for me to care for my hair myself. And whoever is the uh, hairdresser should make sure that they know how to do kinky hair. And he said, well, I have the finest hairdresser in the country who's going to do the film. And I said, fine, well, let's find out if he can do kinky hair. So, of course, he could not do kinky <laughs> hair. I said, um, now, would you explain, please, how you're going to do my hair now? And he said, well, what does one do? I said, well, now you have to do the hot combs and the curling eyes. He went back and explained to the producer director that he could not do my hair. Now, producer director is Otto Preminger. <laughs> I have to tell you that because that adds to the story. We go on location. It's very humid, very hot. My hair begins to in front of his very eyes, and he keeps yelling for the hairdresser, yelling for the hairdresser. Hairdresser keeps coming and pushing it down, and I perspire, and it's sticking up again, and he doesn't know what to do. And the story, I can see the whole thing flashing in front of Otto's face. <gasps> she warned me. She warned me. I, and I'm standing there saying, okay, Otto, what are we going to do? The hairdresser became very upset. He yelled at Otto. Otto fired him. <laughs> the day's work was uh, practically ruined. And uh, we came back that day, and Otto said, OK, what are we going to do? And if you happen to spot the waitress with a bunny tail who served Carol her drink, then you're as eagle-eyed as local architecture critic Lee Bay, who pointed it out as evidence that the long-lost interview was shot at the Lake Geneva Playboy Club. And if you missed it, you can watch it again along with the rest of Diane Carroll's interview on our website. For many people, the events of the last four years have felt like the result of a failure by the U.S. to act upon the lessons of its past. During the civil rights era, writer James Baldwin bore witness to America's second great racial reckoning in his work. This week's Black Voices Book Club selection revisits Baldwin's words as the nation once again grapples with its racial conscience. The book is called Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Joining us now is the author, Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. He's also a Princeton University professor and contributor for MSNBC. Welcome to Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, Dr. Glaude. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to so have much. you. Absolutely. So when this book was released, it was actually last summer, June 2020. We were, the nation was in the throes of a racial uprising. Now we are a month into uh, a new presidential administration and six weeks removed from that insurrection on January 6th. Are we, is the country, uh, as you and as James Baldwin say, are we beginning again? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure at all. I mean, in some ways we have to read what happened on January 6th as an extension of that racial reckoning. You know, the racial reckoning isn't just about police killing us. It's also about the ways in which whiteness continues to animate the distribution of advantage and disadvantage in this country. And January 6th was really about a, a mostly white mob uh, sacking the Capitol in the name of white grievance and white resentment and white hatreds. And I hope that we don't trade one fantasy for another, the fantasy of Trumpism for the fantasy of, you know, the Biden-Harris administration affirming America's inherent goodness and putting the republic back to sleep. We still have a lot of work to do. Why do you think Baldwin's writing has undergone this resurgence that we've seen recently? I think he's the most prescient writer about American democracy and race that we've ever produced. And in so many ways, he was ahead of his time, right? He's kind of misfitted, kind of forcing us to think about the problem from different angles. And we're in this moment where it seems as if uh, what he spied on the horizon in, the, in those early days have come to fruition, and so folks are reaching for him because I think he offers the most insightful, um, insightful commentary on on the contradiction at the heart of American democracy. Right? He he kept track of the serpent that always threatened to swallow whole our experiment, as it were. 
Now here at WTTW, we have a little bit of our own uh, James Baldwin archive. Here is a clip from an interview that he did with our own John Calloway back in 1985. Speaking as a writer again, sometimes you're writing a page or a sentence and you have to change a word in the sentence. Now when you change that word, you move that word out or put another word in, you've changed the entire page. You change the high page. Now, one could consider that what we as Americans are going through as we approach the end of the 20th century, it might be useful to change a single word. We talk about the black problem. It might be interesting to see what would happen to the page if one decided to discuss the white problem. Now, Dr. Glaude, you argue that the country is founded on a lie and that that lie uh, is that the black man is not a man. Thus, the country then forgives itself for the treatment that it inflicts on uh, black people for so many years. Um, and as Baldwin just said that, you know, that we frame this as a black problem versus being a white problem. Then the question is, how do you convince someone uh, of the truth when, as you say, what they've been seeing is a lie for so long? Well, I mean, in some ways, um, the fact that the country's broken occasions a possibility for us to, to kind of confront the ugliness of, of who we are and, and, and what we've done. At the heart of Baldwin's corpus is this radical inversion that the problem isn't us, it never, it never has been. And so when we begin to understand uh, uh, that it hasn't been us, that, you know, it's Baldwin who would say, I'm not the N-word. The question is, why did you need the N-word in the first place? And that, that inversion shifts, shifts the burden of analysis. In a moment of crisis, we have an opportunity. Now, it doesn't guarantee that, that people will listen. It doesn't guarantee that people will, be, will find the move compelling. But it certainly orients those of us who are trying to build the New Jerusalem differently, you see. It will orient us differently as we try to build solidarities to give, you know, to, to, to help bring a new America into being as we shift, oh, I love that formulation, as we change the word, you know? That, that's wonderfully put. Of course it is. <laughs> oh, and, and I, you know, in your talking about this book, I know that you refer to James Baldwin, the rest of us call him James Baldwin because he's James Baldwin. You call him Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you call yeah. him Jimmy? You know, I've been walking with Baldwin for, you know, Jimmy for 30, 30 years. And it's an intimate kind of relationship for me, um, teaching me how to be, how to manage my rage, how to confront my own vulnerabilities, um, urging me as I was trying to write this book uh, to, to, to not imitate him, but to, to trust my own voice, uh, to understand what it means to be a witness. So. I affectionately call him Jimmy because there's this intimacy that I have with his body of work, um, um, and and so it is it is it's an announcement in some ways, Brandis, of what he means to me. Absolutely. So. You've cautioned against teaching black history uh, in a manner that sanitizes historic figures like Martin Luther King into this, you know, sort of safe, heroic reduction um, of who he was versus what the fight was actually like for him. Do you think this allows people to sanitize uh, the history of racist and racism in a, in a similar way? Sure, Dr. King is, you know, his bones have been picked clean. And oftentimes he's invoked in our politics as a kind of rear guard action to contain radical imagination, to, to, to arrest uh, demands for substantive change. Think about how Dr. King's voice is used in the context of our debates around policing in this moment. So absolutely, there is a sense in which in our moment there, there has been an effort to narrow the range of what constitutes legitimate forms of black politics. And Dr. King is often invoked as the principal uh, representative of what is legitimate forms. And, and what's so ironic about it and insidious actually, is that it is, a, it is a caricature of Dr. King's life, of his witness. It's almost as if we keep, we, we freeze him in 1963 and then we murder him over and over again every holiday by locking him into 1963, you see. So absolutely, absolutely. In the few seconds we've got left, uh, Dr. Glaude, what would Baldwin say about the state of, uh, of racial equality today? 
I wouldn't dare try to anticipate Brother Jimmy's words, but I know what I've learned from him. And what he would say is that what we have to do is tell the truth about where we are. And where we are is where we've always been. And that is that America needs to grow up finally and face its ghosts. Okay. Our thanks to Dr. Eddie Glaude. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Again, the book is called Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. And you can read an excerpt on our website. A group of young women are changing the narrative of gospel music and who it's for. Arts correspondent Angel Edo meets a band of sisters who are on a mission. Seated in majesty, you are the risen king. Meet gospel group A for L or All for Love. As I open my soul, take control of my emotions. I love you, simply love you. They're four sisters on a mission to share their love for Christ through gospel music. The word gospel means good news. And so um, it's just really great to be able to share a message of hope and encouragement to people. Until I wake. With your seal upon my heart. It's just a culture of our family, just from our dad being the owner of MusicNet, as along with his brother, the pri uh, one of the proprietors. They they really did instill in us, just like as a father, just like hum the one in this song. Like he made sure we knew the music theory and understand that like the number system, and like come to this piano, find the G, find the C. Mm -hmm. So I think it really birthed from just like our DNA and just being his daughters. They say the diverse music training from their father and uncle, Alan and Aaron Franklin at the Music Net School of Music helped them narrow their focus. Gospel music brings life and hope. And uh, I'm just happy that they, they chose, chose that route. It's something when you leave a gospel concert, you have a feeling like of hope and you're uplifted and it's just, it's just a different feeling. Gospel music is so like um, broad, like you have a lot of like range, like from choirs to quartet to um, now I feel like now this, um, like the worship gospel is coming to like a new, new heights. And so um, I think like um, we kind of been exploring what our, what our niche is in the gospel world and in gospel music. So it's been fun to kind of just have those liberties. As an official group for the past seven years, A4L says the biggest difference between gospel music and comparison to other genres is the message. That's what I feel like is the difference between gospel music and the songs of today. Like, I can listen to a song right now and it, it can tell me what I'm going through, but what is a song that can tell me how to get past it? Mm -hmm. And so that's what gospel music does. It, you listen to it and you're like, wow, not only am I going through a trial, but Jesus is the one that can get me through it. There's messages that are put in the music too. So you may forget everything the pastor may say, but there might be a song that really blessed you, you know, or a song that really like, that gave you hope or encouraged you or gave you freedom. You have won the victory. The whole goal of gospel music, you should want to like grow into something better. You know, you should want to be better. You should want to live better. You should want to change an old mindset, get a new perspective, you know. And so I think that should be the goal of gospel music. But I know for, for us, that's our goal too, that people just are radically transformed by what they hear. I'm waiting on you. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. On you, and I won't move. I'm waiting on and visit our website for more information on A4L. They'll be releasing their first album later this year. And be sure to check out the new two-part PBS documentary series, The Black Church. This is our story, this is our church. Details on how to watch are on our website. 
And that's our show for this Sunday night. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com slash news for the very latest news from WTTW. And join Paris Shuts and me tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. City Council members debate if COVID relief money should be used to cover police costs. And celebrating Black History Month with the Chicago Children's Choir. And join me tomorrow night at 8 for Black Voices February Community Conversation. I'll be joined by four black women leaders in Chicago. We're shining a light on black women, the power they hold while overcoming adversities specific to them. You can visit WTTW.com slash events to RSVP. And we leave you tonight with more music from the group A4L. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Seated in majesty, you are the risen king. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.